Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte Gill, an Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Centre for Evidence-Based Crime Policy in the Department of Criminology, Law and Society at George Mason University. I'm delighted to be here with Molly today at this first virtual ASCBP conference. You can read a little bit more about me and my work here. So today Molly and I are going to talk to you about Proactive Alliance, which is a new innovative idea for a police community engagement training that combines evidence-based principles from counselling psychology with what we know about effective policing to build relationships with the community. And the goal of Proactive Alliance really is to strengthen evidence-based policing so that it can be implemented even more successfully. So those of us in the evidence-based policing world know that there are a number of proactive policing strategies that really try to get at problems before they become bigger crime issues. And these have been shown to be effective in ultimately preventing crime. So we know from systematic reviews that problem-oriented policing is effective for crime prevention, that disorder or broken windows policing is effective when police collaborate with the community to identify and prioritize disorder problems. And community policing, while it doesn't have any impact on crime prevention, does improve community attitudes like satisfaction with the police and has some weaker but definitely positive impacts on police legitimacy. And community is a thread that runs through all of these evidence-based principles, right? Problem-oriented policing doesn't have to be done in collaboration with the community, but community is a really important element and the COPS office definition of community policing includes this aspect of problem solving. Gary Cordner and others have suggested that problem-oriented policing is really the tactical element of the broader community policing philosophy. But there's a challenge, right? So although many of these evidence-based policing strategies rely on that meaningful collaboration with the community to be successful, we don't know a lot about how the police get the community to engage in the first place. This is kind of a black box in the evidence base for these approaches. And it's pretty obvious to many police officers and researchers alike that the police can't just go into a community, particularly one where they don't have existing relationships with community members, and expect the public to engage with them right away in crime prevention. Some communities have historically strained relationships with the police, and there needs to be a lot of addressing trauma and building trust that takes place before any kind of meaningful collaboration can occur. Even when the police are used to working in particular communities, there are so many complex issues to balance, right? You might have, for example, a nightlife district in your jurisdiction where you have to balance very sensitive competing interests between patrons who want to go out and enjoy a night out, business owners who want to increase their revenue and do their business, residents who might be sick to death of the noise at 2am when everyone comes out at the bars. Everybody has a legitimate concern in that environment. So how do the police manage and navigate that balance between all of those different competing interests? Another challenge with community engagement is that when departments make this a priority, it really requires a fundamental shift in traditional ideas about what are the duties of police, what are their roles, and how should police agencies be managed. So one of the key elements of community-oriented policing is this idea of organisational transformation, where police organisations move away from that traditional top-down hierarchical approach and give a lot of power to the officers on the street to be able to make decisions and figure out what's the best way to engage the community, prioritise decision-making and engage in problem-solving. But organisational change is hard, and what we see typically in places where community policing has been researched is that Often these community policing teams are specific units within a broader organisational context that isn't necessarily favourable to that more decentralised approach. We also know, especially those of you who are first-line supervisors, that it can be really challenging to do something different and to take a risk and to act in ways that might go against the traditional culture of the organisation. So that lack of support can be really challenging. And that not only has an impact on the effectiveness of evidence-based policing strategies, but also on officer well-being. It can be very, very stressful to be in a position where you're expected at the community level to be able to be flexible and responsive and make decisions, but not necessarily feel like your management or your leadership is supportive of that. On the other hand, there's some evidence that successful community engagement can actually be beneficial to officer well-being because problem solving presents an interesting challenge. There's something different to do every day. And while that's always the case in policing, allowing police to use a broader range of skills can be very satisfying. So why is all this important to the success of evidence-based policing? Well, really, community support is the foundation of effective policing. In a democratic society, the police are really policing on the mandate of the public, right? Um, And through the elected officials who are elected by the public, 
So every strategy, every evidence-based policing approach that police agencies engage in really needs to be done against the backdrop of community trust, legitimacy, support, and participation. So this is where we started thinking about how to take evidence-based policing to the next level. We know these strategies work, we know they rely on community support, legitimacy, and participation, but we don't know very much about how to successfully build that community engagement. And that's where Proactive Alliance comes in. Thank you, Dr. Gill. I'm Molly Mastoris, a licensed professional counselor in Northern Virginia and co-founder of Safe Night LLC. I'm going to explain the specifics of Proactive Alliance, including its foundations and applied psychology, and some of the early successes in the context of the Arlington Restaurant Initiative. But first, I am thrilled to be given the opportunity to present at the ASEBP conference this year. Thank you for your interest in our panel. You can read more about my professional experience on the next page. Proactive Alliance empowers officers to actively and meaningfully engage with the public before a conflict occurs using perspectives, methods, and techniques that originate from clinical and counseling psychology. When a crisis does occur, the established relationship acts as a problem-solving medium, giving the officer more options than enforcement alone, including the ability to draw from the community for the most effective solutions. Proactive Alliance is not a transactional approach, although some techniques can certainly be used in this way. Rather, it is a purposeful shift from an adversarial stance to a collaborative one by teaching officers to safely act as agents of change. So the goals of Proactive Alliance are likely the same goals as most community policing approaches. One element that I would like to highlight is, that, is the job satisfaction piece. This goal is related to officer wellness, which is a built-in part of Proactive Alliance, specifically in the form of teaching officers how to establish appropriate interpersonal boundaries and maintain emotional safety at work, which I will elaborate on a little bit later. The origin of Proactive Alliance is both a professional and a personal story. Professionally, I've always provided in-person services with clients and their families and work with professionals from other agencies. So like police officers, I work directly with people most of the time. While working for Child Protective Services and in a residential treatment facility for court-ordered adolescent girls, most people I worked with didn't want to work with me or were ordered to do so by a judge, which is generally not at all effective in terms of counseling outcomes. Um, similarly to police, I was put in the difficult position of trying to accomplish a goal and elicit change, but often did not have the cooperation of those that I was working with. Although my training um, was essential to uh, managing these challenges, it was my experience over the years, including lots of trial and error, Implementing that training that allowed me to see how many of the counseling techniques that are part of Proactive Alliance work in the real world. Essentially, I have personally practiced all the techniques that are used in Proactive Alliance uh, throughout my career. And personally, my husband of almost 15 years is a police officer, as are many of our friends and some family members. So I have an intimate understanding of the personal impact of policing on officers as human beings and also on families and spouses. When my husband, Jim Mastoris, began a new assignment as restaurant liaison with the Arlington County Police Department, he was tasked with reducing alcohol-related harm and more efficiently using county resources in a very active nightlight area called Clarendon. Um, so when he started, he didn't really know where to begin, so we talked about this a lot. Um, and although we usually don't, or in my case can't, for confidentiality reasons, talk about the specifics of our work, I suggested that he try some clinical techniques, such as motivational interviewing techniques to interact with stakeholders who are difficult to engage with. There are many perspectives and approaches in counseling psychology, developed from years of theory, research, and practice in the field. Although some practitioners ascribe to a single approach, most of us use an eclectic array of theories and practices depending on the client, 
the issues presented and the specific challenges of the case. Proactive Alliance draws from the classic foundations of modern psychology, including the work of Freud, psychodynamic theory, including the concepts of defense mechanisms and drives, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, attachment theory from the work of Mary Ainsworth, John Bowlby, and others, um, Donald Winnicott's concept of good enough parenting, Judith Herman's work on trauma, and the child development work of Jean Piaget and Eric Erickson, among other perspectives. Uh, these theories provide the context for current evidence-based counseling techniques, including cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, created by Aaron Beck, and motivational interviewing, which was created by William Miller and Stephen Rolnick, but is actually grounded in the work of Carl Rogers. So years of psychological research inform the perspective and methods of proactive alliance and evidence-based psychotherapeutic methods provide the basis for the adapted techniques. Although the specific elements of this um, multifaceted foundation are not specifically taught to police, it is important that um, it's understood that these are not fly-by-night approaches or pop psychology, but based on years of academic study and practical application in the field of psychology. And most importantly, they can be taught and used in a purposeful, methodical way in the context of policing. So clearly, therapy techniques in their original state are not appropriate in the police setting. Um, and as Jim and I talked about certain interactions with restaurant owners, security staff, and other stakeholders, I found that I was able to advise him using adapted versions of counseling and clinical psychology concepts in a way that he understood well and could replicate. So after talking, you know, about a certain approach at night in our living room, Jim could go out to Clarendon the next day and try it and then come home and tell me how it went. So we were able to experiment with different approaches and ideas in real time, track his progress and shift approaches as needed. With his feedback about his experience in the field, I was able to adapt approaches for different situations and coach him on how to respond to specific problems or challenging interactions. Metaphorically, he was learning how to use a scalpel rather than a hammer when interacting with community members and was engaging in nuanced interactions rather than a more blunt enforcement only approach, which he was more accustomed to but had not been working well in this context. While I was teaching and adapting different psychotherapeutic techniques, um, we were gauging Jim's progress week by week. We were not yet calling this approach Proactive Alliance at that time, but we were just brainstorming and trying to create solutions from different perspectives. Um, because I'd been using these techniques in my work for so long, I had to think backwards from practice to theory and technique to recall why these methods work so I could explain them accurately and actually teach them. Um, this was when I realized that many counseling psychology techniques could be adapted and made accessible so that law enforcement's efforts to connect to the community could be more focused and systematic. Certainly, some officers are already successfully connecting with the community and do this really well. Proactive Alliance can validate those successes by identifying what they're doing that works and why, and then building on it creating a purposeful and methodical approach that can be taught and replicated. Police officers and therapists actually have a lot in common, most importantly, wanting to create safety and facilitate problem solving. The difference is therapists are taught explicitly how to establish relationships and to elicit change based on psychological research and study and development of clinical practical technique, and officers are not. I attended three years of graduate school, two year long internships, and three years of working as a resident in counseling to learn these techniques well, and I still find it difficult to engage with some people, never mind guide them to change their behavior. So the question is, how in the world can police be expected to do this? They need training. Community policing often entails engaging with those entities that are eager to engage with police, like civic organizations, or with the community through events like Coffee with a Cop and National Night Out. Although these are important efforts, they do not often reach the community members that are more challenging to engage. 
Proactive Alliance focuses on those stakeholders who are more difficult to establish a relationship with using methods from person-centered therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, and others, and establishing a collaborative relationship. Jim found that a collaborative perspective and using adapted psychotherapeutic techniques gained the trust of stakeholders over time and served as the foundation to maintain important working relationships. After this approach worked with his initial attempts, he then had a roadmap as to how to engage with other stakeholders in the future. As a result, this relationship-based approach became the foundation for the Arlington Restaurant Initiative, or ARI, a program recognized by the COPS Office and the Center for Problem-Oriented Policing. Based on the success of ARI, Jim began using the foundation of these techniques to help create the Business Safety Initiative in Arlington, a program focused on workplace violence prevention, and also inspired a relationship-based approach in the development of the Homeless Outreach Coalition, a program initiated by Arlington County Officer Mike Keene. Proactive Alliance is based on the notion that an individual officer's self, or authenticity, personality, and personal judgment, is an asset. Therefore, understanding, maintaining, and protecting the self is a pivotal tenet of Proactive Alliance. The self is treated as a valuable and powerful tool that must be known, cared for, and used safely. When officers are adept at using their self as a tool, they can then become an agent of change. The self is an officer's individuality, which is often purposely suppressed in the context of police work, for good reason. Proactive Alliance asserts that officers can use their most valuable instrument, their humanity, in a safe and appropriate way that is beneficial for both the officer and the community. Understanding, creating, and maintaining appropriate interpersonal boundaries, understanding locus of control, and acknowledging and understanding the power differential between the police and the community are all part of understanding and protecting the self. Police are not used to considering emotional safety when on the job, but it's time to change that. Officers deserve to know how to protect themselves, their real selves, on the job so that they can engage with the community in an authentic way and remain emotionally intact. In the context of Proactive Alliance, officers are taught the same methods as trained mental health professionals to be emotionally safe on the job, just as shooting at the range and engaging in defensive tactics training keeps them physically safe. When I was a CPS worker, Jim would always be nervous when I had to go to homes in high crime neighborhoods by myself with no protection. But I always joked that I had my clinical skills to protect me. But this was true, it is true. Being able to talk to people and establish a relationship with them, regardless of your role, is essential to preempting crises or managing them in a safer way. In the best case scenario, after building a durable relationship with a stakeholder, they will even alert you to a problem before it happens so you can manage it together. The challenge of being yourself and interacting genuinely with others is maintaining a healthy boundary between your private thoughts, emotions, and biases and the person with which you're interacting. You are not ignoring these factors. Just the opposite, you are actively pursuing a better understanding of yourself so that you can purposely acknowledge and manage your feelings, fears, frustrations, and other emotional reactions that may cloud your judgment. This is true for all people, not just the police. Just as therapists are taught to protect themselves from emotional exposure in the workplace and not become personally involved with clients, while still maintaining the ability to effectively guide and collaborate with them, Proactive Alliance teaches officers to use their authentic self to connect with others while protecting their emotional well-being from harm or interference. Officers learn specific steps to understand, establish, and maintain interpersonal boundaries, including how to identify when their boundaries are being crossed and how to manage their reactions. Being a proactive ally means first engaging in unconditional positive regard, a concept developed by Carl Rogers. 
Unconditional positive regard is the concept of accepting and supporting someone without judgment of their behavior. In the context of proactive alliance and its use of productive empathy, it is important to differentiate between accepting and understanding or agreeing. Officers may not understand or agree with the stakeholder's behavior, but accepting the reality of their circumstance or position is essential to begin a collaborative process. Productive empathy is the proactive alliance term for using empathy in a manner that is mutually beneficial to both parties. In counseling psychology, the emotional benefit is not intended to be mutual. I might enjoy my job, but should not be invested in the outcome of therapy outside of the client's needs and goals. Productive empathy is empathy that has a job, so to speak. It is employed as genuine empathy, but with the purpose of reaching a goal or to solve a complex community problem. When thinking of the collaborative perspective, a visual image always works well for me. I think of standing side by side with someone and looking at a problem together, not engaging from an adversarial or face-to-face -face stance. In this stance, the problem exists between two people and can get lost in a problematic interpersonal relationship, whereas when collaborating, you have two sets of eyes on the problem and two brains on the solution. By engaging in a cognitive behavioral therapy method called cognitive reframing or restructuring, an officer begins an interaction noting what a stakeholder is doing well and then addressing problems and issues from that point. Additionally, when faced with a crisis, the officer can point out what the stakeholder did well first and then attempt to reframe the crisis as an opportunity for growth, development, and change. Rather than de-escalating a situation, which police are often taught to do through many transactional methods, a situation does not escalate in the same way because a positive relationship is already in place and communication is already occurring. So there are fewer surprises or crises that have not been preemptively addressed. The goal of teaching these techniques is to allow officers to work toward responsive collaboration or the act of working side by side in cooperation rather than from an adversarial stance. Police are taught adapted techniques from motivational interviewing and the concept of the stages of change to understand the importance of collaboration and to disengage from the power struggle that can ensue when telling someone what to do. Police know better than anyone that telling people what to do is often unsuccessful. The collaborative position empowers police to initiate relationships to establish and maintain collaborative changes, saving enforcement only for when absolutely necessary. In the climate of COVID-19, police are being asked to regulate and monitor public behavior around social distancing and gatherings, a mandate they have not had before and are struggling to enforce consistently. Because police are forward-facing in the community and are expected to manage many of society's issues, Proactive Alliance can help facilitate a change in attitude and behavior toward compliance, even before a crisis occurs. By using responsive collaboration, police have already set up a mechanism to depend on the community to do their part and maintain a new, new community guidelines. Police are one piece of the larger puzzle of this public health crisis or any large scale community problem. Proactive Alliance gives guidance as to how to collaborate with other government agencies like public health, planning, economic development, and municipal leadership to manage complex problems and coordinate the public response. Proactive Alliance is meant to facilitate the cooperation of the public, including public agencies, in circumstances when police cannot possibly take full responsibility for enforcing such standards. Self-awareness is the most basic and most important way to take care of yourself and is a central aspect of proactive alliance. It is important for police to know themselves well so they can identify when they are struggling and articulate their experience to a mental health professional to receive the most effective intervention. In proactive alliance training, police are presented with overviews of common mental health issues such as anxiety and depression and how to identify the symptoms of these disorders. 
We also address the impact of vicarious trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, which are persistent occupational hazards for police. We discuss specific ways police can advocate for themselves when accessing and engaging in mental health treatment, including differentiating the roles of mental health professionals and addressing preconceptions about mental illness. Now I'm going to pass the presentation back to Dr. Gill, who will discuss how Proactive Alliance might work and the potential benefits for evidence-based policing. Now we want to be transparent that Proactive Alliance hasn't been evaluated yet, so we're not calling Proactive Alliance itself an evidence-based strategy, although we are in the process of working on developing a rigorous experiment in order to test its effectiveness. But we wanted to finish up by talking a little bit about what that experiment might look like in terms of what are some of the outcomes that we're interested in and what do we think the impact on the field might be if it is indeed effective. So we think that Proactive Alliance will have both short and long-term benefits. Immediately after the training, we see it improving officer knowledge about Proactive Alliance principles, about their own role as agents of change, and how to harness these concepts of productive empathy and unconditional positive regard that helps them engage better with the community. In the shorter term, we think that this improved knowledge will translate into skills and attitudes. For example, increased agency to engage in problem solving, improved job satisfaction. I mentioned at the beginning the relationship between police community engagement and job satisfaction and improved perceptions of members of the community in which officers who are trained are working. And ultimately, in the long term, we see these improvements translating into behavior change. So officers being more likely to adhere to principles of procedural justice in their interactions with the community, improved ability to make decisions, and improved communication with a broad range of community stakeholders to help identify and prioritize those problems and balance those competing interests that I talked about earlier. Ultimately, we think that if effective proactive alliance could have a lot of potential benefits for evidence-based policing more broadly. First of all, we think that it could address some of the implementation challenges around community policing, particularly this idea of organizational transformation. It's always been very unclear in the literature how that piece of the community policing definition works. The community engagement seems obvious enough, even if we don't really know how to do it very well. The problem solving piece, we know what that entails. But changing the whole organization, reorienting organizational culture around community engagement seems to be very challenging and something that not a lot of departments have done successfully. So we think that beyond just sort of a general community policing training for officers in the organization, having all officers equipped with this tool in their duty belt of how to better communicate and engage and problem solve with the community could help to address this issue, right? Because that gets to this idea of decentralization empowering officers to be able to make those decisions on the ground. We also think that Proactive Alliance could potentially have a long-term effect on crime prevention. While we know that community policing itself doesn't have strong effects on preventing crime, we do see it improving police-community relations in the shorter term. And while we need more research on this relationship between community engagement and crime prevention, in our view, Proactive Alliance could help officers to better build that trust in relationships with the community, that ultimately translates into improved satisfaction from the community, improved perceptions of legitimacy, and maybe an increased willingness to participate. And we know that when the police and community collaborate together in problem solving, in problem oriented policing, that can have an effect on crime prevention. Now in 2009, Matthew Scheider and colleagues wrote an article about community policing as the backdrop for other evidence-based strategies. And this has always been a really interesting idea to me because what they're saying is that we shouldn't think about community policing itself as an evidence-based strategy, but as a foundation for all the other evidence-based strategies. And again, that's kind of what I was getting at earlier in the presentation, talking about the community as being the foundation for effective policing. So we think that by strengthening relationships between police and the community, Proactive Alliance could ultimately strengthen that foundation that allows other evidence-based strategies to be successful. And finally, we think that empowering officers and by equipping them with these tools, we can really go a long way in improving officer well-being. We are encouraged by the potential of Proactive Alliance in the context of policing based on our preliminary experiences. We are hopeful that it can also address other types of long-term chronic issues in the community and enhance existing evidence-based policing strategies. I would like to thank Dr. Charlotte Gill, my business partner and husband, Master Police Officer Jim S. Doris, and the members of ASEBP for inviting us to present today. 
Stay safe and well.